Good night, everyone. I had the dubious honor of going after some very talented entrepreneurs and some very talented speakers. So I'll do my, and plus, you, you're probably all very tired and ready for some mezcal. So I'll try to keep it as lively as possible. Um, but this is a bilingual school, and I'm not crazy about the language switching. So let me, let's take a vote. If you sit down, we're cool to go forward in English. If you stand up for just one second, you'd rather be in Spanish. Y hablo español. <laughs> Nadie se quiere parar? Sí? ¿Qué prefieren? No? No hay quórum. Yo, yo me imaginé que todo el mundo se iba a parar, pero no. Okay? In English it is. Well, look, first of all, I really want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about something which I am very passionate about and everybody who's part of my community is passionate about, which is how technology and in particular how is the internet and computer science going to continue to transform and improve our lives. But it's actually much harder than you think to cover everything that the internet may do and that computer science may do in the next 15 minutes. We could spend the whole night, and I'm sure you don't want me to do that. There's also another challenge with talking about the future, which is you don't want to go down on the record for saying something really stupid. And some of my favorite quotes were uh, Daryl Zanuck, when the TV was out back in the early 1950s, he said the television was going to disappear. Housewives would get sick of seeing a big box wooden television in their living rooms. Little did he know that, you know, more than 60 years later, we'd continue to watch more than four hours per day. The other favorite quote of mine, which I want to make sure I always avoid, was Ken Olson from NEC, big computer company in the 70s. He said he saw no reason why homes should have computers. Never imagined we'd have more computing power in, in our cell phones than he did with his, um, with his huge devices. So what I'm going to do for the next 14 minutes now, because I've used one, is give you some idea of big tendencies, my favorite tendencies, the things that I think are really going to change the world, and above all, things where Google is placing big bets. When some of these things will actually take place, I leave to your imagination, but I think some of these, again, tendencies are undeniable. I see, I can't see very well, unfortunately, because that way I could empathize more with the crowd, but I get, I get the feeling that you're all very young in general, right? And that's why most of you probably won't remember Werner Vinge. Or has anyone, will anyone admit it? They've heard of Werner Vinge? Werner Vinge, in the 1970s, he spoke about a concept called the singularity. And in his vision, man and machine would fuse into one and create a super intelligence, which would mark the evolution of man. And, you know, some people were scared by that, uh, thinking of an Aurelian future where we lose our humanity. Other, thing, other people are very excited about the possibility. Um, Ray Urswell, who wrote another book recently, who actually joined Google's ranks, he talks about um, the possibility of us living for, uh, forever as our technology continues in health, continues to um, improve exponentially. So whether you think this is a good thing or a bad thing, I have news for you. It's actually inconsequential because it's already happened. We have our cell phones with us every second of the day. Six billion, I think Daniela shared some numbers, seven billion uh, humans, more or less. There's already 6.5 billion phones. There's more access to cellular technology than to uh, water, unfortunately. Um, and smartphones, which had been slow to take off, now there's more than um, a billion smartphones. We have some research that demonstrates that most people, probably all of us here, um, at least 90%, we sleep with our cell phones closer to than one uh, meter away. And then some of the more worrying research is the following, and I'm not making this up. 13 to 30 year olds would rather, on average, be done with their sense of smell than to lose access to their cell phone. <laughs> and those above 18 years old, at least half of them said they were willing to give up sex instead of living, leaving their cell phone. So this is a pretty important device. And whether or not Whether or not we're as addicted to cell phones as I think my wife is, the reality is uh, it's changing all our lives, right? Even, at, even basic applications, core search, uh, video entertainment, just two examples of Google services. We have more than 2.5 billion searches just on mobile devices every single day. We see more than 2 billion videos every single day on YouTube. And if we include applications such as Maps, the rise of social networks, 
and gaming. It's ridiculous. On average, people are checking their phones at least 15 times per minute. That's what, that's what most people are doing. And just look at most people's behavior. And this is also very influenced by the younger generation, which is hyper-connected. When we talk about gaming, uh, this statistic is a little old because it was last year. But on average, people were playing 125 years of Angry Birds every single day. I can't even imagine this year what people played Candy Crush. <laughs> a lot of you look guilty. But if we acknowledge that the phone is already transforming our lives, you know, why is this, if this is a talk about the future, why do I insist that this is important? And there's a futurist called Roy Mera, Roy Mera from the Futurist Center, go figure. He talked about our tendency to overestimating the impact of technology in the short term, but underestimating the impact of the technology over the long term. And I think uh, cellular technology is going to be one of those examples. We're already using it a lot. But the implications for commerce are incredible. Think about it. If I already carry my phone with me all the time, why would I carry a wallet? Why would I need credit cards? We could put up safety measures on top of the cell phone for transactions that credit cards can't offer today. Um, think about um, what Google is working on when we talk about um, image search. Um, I see in the front, for example, the gentleman in front of me who talked about his travel company. He has incredible socks, very cool socks. I should be able to take a picture of those socks and immediately find out in the internet where they're being sold. I can go and buy them myself, or why not go directly to, a, to an online store and purchase them? This isn't the far future. We're working on this technology. And what's even more interesting, and it's probably a, an even closer step to the singularity I was talking about earlier, is uh, Google Glass. What happens when we don't even have to carry our phone, but we simply wear it? And let me show you just a very quick video, if it works if Murphy doesn't manifest himself, as to what this handless experience might look like. And again, this is the immediate future. Okay, Glass, record a video. This is it, we're on in two minutes. Okay, Glass, hang out with the Flying Club. Google photos of tiger heads. Hmm. You ready? You ready? Right there. Okay, Glass, take a picture. Stay delicious and tight. Arroy. Mmm, arroy. Google jellyfish. You weren't seeing the glass up in the right front because of the layout of the screen, but through all those actions, there was actually an interaction with the screen. Murphy had to show up. So moving on to the next uh, tendency, which uh, again is undeniable. I think now there are less than one billion, even though there are three billion internet uh, users, there's less than one billion devices actually connected to the internet. This was figures as of last year. Uh, Garner is projecting that by the year 2025, we're probably going to have 50 billion things connected to the internet. So what does the internet of things looks like? And I think that's one of the main reasons why last year, 
or was it early this year, sorry, we made the acquisition, Google made the acquisition of Nest for almost $3 billion, which all it is today is really just very smart thermostats. But it's the beginning of an intelligent home. It's the beginning of a home where you can control everything around you because it's connected to the internet and because it has computer science technology. And one of the first things that is already being tested, imagine an intelligent refrigerator that is uh, keeping track of the products. It knows when you run out of milk. It can order the milk for you. And then again, since everything is connected to the internet, it can check your own calendar to see when that milk should be delivered so that it gets delivered at a time when you're home. Have you heard of a, a, new, um, a new patent that re, uh, Google re recently filed um, which could uh, change life for diabetics? Anybody who has di uh, who's a diabetic knows how cumbersome it is to test insulin levels and, and constantly be pricking yourself. We have contact lens technology that will be able to measure your sugar levels and send that automatically and we think that could have incredible implications to reduce healthcare costs because by having more data, we'll be able to keep a better track of people and avoid health problems. And precise, and perhaps even most importantly, and the one I look most forward to, particularly in the city of Mexico, is um, driverless cars. And just out of curiosity, how many people were aware that we now have technology in place where cars can drive themselves after you enter an address? Can you raise your hands, please? Okay, this is almost half. Uh, they've accumulated more than 100,000 hours of, uh, of driving time, no accidents, and the technology is there, it works already. And you know, we're on, in a race to deliver, uh, and, um, and so are a few competitors. The, the main risks right now, or the main challenges, are really scale, reducing the cost so that it becomes commercially feasible, and then imagine the world of deal, dealing with liabilities, right? If and when there is an accident, who would you make responsible? But imagine a world where we don't have to worry about traffic anymore because we can just use that time for whatever we want. The other industry that's, that's going to be transformed, and the third tendency I want to talk about is actually very close to heart now that I moved from Google to YouTube, and it's actually one of the reasons why I made this jump. We all grew up, I grew up in Venezuela, as I said uh, earlier, and um, in Venezuela, back in the 70s, 80s, we had two television stations, right? You had, how many in Mexico? Two as well, two or three? And so if you wanted to talk to all of Mexico, you had Siempre en Domingo. And in Venezuela, we had Sábado Sensacional. And you basically had Televisa, Venevisión. In, in the U.S., it was only three or four broadcasters controlling what we saw. In the, U, um, in the U.S., CBS, ABC, NBC, you know, that was 90% of the viewing time back in the 70s, 80s. Then came cable, and we saw the first wave of fragmentation. And we saw for the first time a sports channel, a music channel. Um, the first cable channels were actually pretty low quality, but over time, one could argue that what you get in Showtime today and HBO is probably a higher quality than what we see on broadcast TV on average. Um, today, as it turns out, in the US, 75% of viewing time is on cable. In Latin America, cable penetration is still lagging, but it's definitely a, a, a tendency that's undeniable from broadcast TV to cable television. But now we have television over the internet, and we have services like Netflix, like Hulu, we have Vudu, we have Televisa launching Vio, we have Claro TV, and of course we have YouTube, which I just mentioned, the, the amount of usage on, on our platform is, is fantastic. Think of a world, again, two, four, six, eight years from now, where all televisions are connected. And this year we launched Chromecast, it's a $39 device, to basically make any television with an HDMI port intelligent so you can go on the web and use these services. But think about how our entertainment will change. Think about how advertising will change. How many people with an interactive set-top will have the patience to sit down and see a 30-second 30 30 television commercial about something that they're not interested in? It simply won't exist. Plus, every kind of advertising is going to have a direct marketing component. If you're watching any branding campaign um, but that offers the product or a view of the product, there's no reason why you might, you might not be able to capture that impulse by and have a direct connection to an e-commerce site. Um, so the world of television, brace yourselves. I don't know when exactly it will change, but we're not going to watch television the way we've been watching it up until now. The four hours that most people are spending on open TV today, in the next two, three, four, five years, will be fragmented across mobile tablet devices with huge opportunities for new content creators and for new ad formats. The last pillar 
that I want to share with you is education. I thought it was fitting given that we're here in the American school. And I was very interested to hear about what the Innova team is, is accomplishing in this field. How many of you heard of Sal Khan? This is one of my heroes. I think maybe that was less than a quarter of the audience. But um, Sal Khan um, is a hedge fund manager, was a hedge fund manager in New York. And he had a, a, a niece back in Louisiana who was struggling with algebra. And he wanted to get her these videos. He was trying to tutor her, and he thought, what better way than to start putting these videos on YouTube? But before he knew it, a lot of these videos were being shared by his, by his niece with her friends. And he started to get hundreds of thousands of views. And he knew he was onto something. And what he's done now on YouTube, but also on his own website, he's, basic, he's basically mapping out human knowledge, starting from very basic arithmetic to algebra, to calculus, to physics. But then he's going on to biology, to chemistry. Um, so again, for all of us who have kids here, or who know people that are struggling, this is an incredible asset. Uh, but having all of this knowledge on video and available for anyone on demand is only the first step. Don't you think it's curious that something as important as education has evolved so little over the last 500 years? We still have, for all effective purposes, the sage on a stage. The person who has something to share, and everybody else who's supposed to sit down and listen quietly and nod in approval. Um, that's what our students do each day in class most of the day. And I know that the American school um, excels in that there's much more interactivity in the class. But imagine if we flip the classroom around. And Sal is already in tests with schools in Los Altos to try a model where the class is actually seen at home. That way you rewind and play as many times as you want. You have to go to the bathroom, you come back, you, you start watching where you left off. If you don't understand something, well, man, maybe just watching that video over and over again will eventually sink in. But then classroom time is actually reserved to work with your colleagues, with, uh, with your professor, to work on things that your teacher can actually help you with. And this could be the beginning of an education revolution that may change the way that we teach our children everywhere. So I think um, this is one of the most exciting promises of the technology as well. But if we go back to the origin and the reason I was invited here was to talk about communities. And you know, this ASF community, even though I'm not a, technically an alumni, I've, I feel a profound affinity because I have three kids here in, in the American school. But even more so because when I come to campus, it reminds me of the American school I went to when I was in Caracas. It's actually a very similar vibe. But you know, this is one very fortunate community, going back to luck, which was talked about earlier. Uh, when we talked about a lot, we talk about a lot of our friends or the other communities that we engage in, you know, again, I think we're all very privileged and fortunate. And I think a lot of us, most of us have a certain level of optimism, right? We think a lot of the technology, a lot of the things that we talked about tonight are going to happen regardless, right? These are trends that are unstoppable. Well, I have news for you, and it's not that nice. When I grew up in Venezuela, again, back in the 70s or the 80s, the last thing I would have imagined is that somewhere in the future, 10, 15, 20 years down the line, there'd be people on the streets chanting, Patria, Socialismo, Muerte. And this is not a Venezuelan phenomenon. What's happening in Venezuela right now, and the reaction against it, can happen in any of our countries. Latin America, wherever you have such inequalities, when you have so, so many people with such access to great education, to technology, to so much opportunities, while so many people are clearly being left behind, my challenge to you, and what I'd like to leave you tonight, is to think that our community is also our entire country. And that we have more obligations to our entire country than just working hard, making money, and paying taxes. And we have to do it because it's the right thing to do, it's the human thing to do, but it's also the smart thing to do. Because we don't want something like this happening in such a beautiful place as Mexico. With that, I want to thank you very much. Thank you.